we got Michael on the line. What do you want to ask him? Who's your avatar? Who's your ideal dream investor? Like, who are you trying to help? My ideal investor is somebody who's engaged, wants mm -hmm. to learn, could potentially be a future, you know, general partner and just likes talking real estate because I really like talking real estate. Hey, I'm Brian Briscoe, host of the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. And this podcast is different from everything else out there. I bring together new and aspiring investors on each and every episode and let the aspiring investors ask the questions that they need answered. And if you're an aspiring investor yourself, you probably have the same questions. So before you get to this episode that we have prepared for you, make sure you hit the subscribe button and that little notification bell to make sure you get notified every time we post a new episode. And now enjoy the show. Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe. Very excited for today's show. It's one of our Ask the Expert series, and we have two amazing guys on the line with us today. We got Michael Messner, our experienced investor, and Dane Johnson, our aspiring investor. So guys, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Going to be a lot of fun. You know, I've known Michael for a couple of years now. He came on the, the podcast earlier. Um, we're going to put that episode somewhere in the show notes as well. But, you know, Michael, welcome to the show today. And how are you doing? Thanks. I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm excited to be back. I was in Dane's uh, seat last time and a lot has happened since then. And uh, glad to be on the other side of it. Yeah. I mean, a whole lot has happened since then. I mean, you guys are, are coming full cycle on, on the first acquisition you guys had. I'm excited to hear about that and everything else. But I mean, before we get into deal specific stuff, tell us about yourself first. Sure. So I come to real estate from a family that's sort of been involved from, from different angles. My dad was an architect, my brother is an architect and, a, and an architecture professor. So I, um, you know, had it in the blood a little bit. My mom has always been an entrepreneur. They all came at it from sort of the creative side and, and that philosophical side of just like having an idea, especially from the architecture, having that idea. And then, you know, a couple of years later, you see this building, right? In, in reality. And I always yeah. felt like that was amazing. I went in more on the business side. I got my MBA. My background was in research before that, actually. So mm -hmm. I've always had kind of a strong analytical data science yeah. uh, approach to this that eventually led into kind of finance and the financial side. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm winding my way back. I, you know, we're actually learning a lot more about development now and, and talking to the architects and et cetera. But for now, really happy to be in multifamily investing and helping investors hit those returns. Yeah, that's what it's about. You know, helping the investors hit the numbers that the investors want. So let's talk about your start in multifamily. You know, how did you get started and what were kind of the biggest challenges you had to go through up front? Sure. So this is probably going to be a familiar story for a lot mm -hmm. of folks. Went, you know, my job went remote. This was actually before COVID. So mm -hmm. Maybe got a little bit of a head start on, on a lot of the folks, but yep. I'm here in Southern California. I was commuting almost three hours a day sometimes, yep. and suddenly I had three extra hours a day, and uh, I, I thought, you know, I've been talking about getting into this for so long, getting into real mm -hmm. estate in general for so long. I could either spend that extra time, you know, playing video games, or <laughs> I could yeah. just you know, finally do it, right? I started with a quad. So I actually started in multifamily, did not do the single family, found an, a relatively inexpensive quad in the Midwest. Yeah. That went really, really well. I bought a duplex a couple months after that. And this all actually started with just a HELOC on our primary home. So mm -hmm. see, I, I haven't invested a dollar, you know, net yeah. at least. I've never put a dollar in, you know, to real estate. It started with a HELOC. Bought a duplex a couple months after that. Mm -hmm. Things were going really, really well. This was 2019, I guess. And uh, I thought, okay, time to scale. I'm going to start buying two duplexes at a time. So I bought two duplexes on the same day. And then shortly after that, I learned more about through multifamily, right? Yeah. And, and, and really scaling up and got into syndications. Yeah. Now, I mean, you live in Southern California. You decided to invest in the Midwest you know, why, why Midwest and what, what city particularly did you guys decide to invest in and uh, kind of walk us through your decision process for investing there instead of where you're at? Sure. So I'm, a, I'm originally from Wisconsin um, and I, I love the Midwest. I mean, everything about it um, from a, just a, you know, a people and tenants and, and, and hardworking aspect and, and you name it, but also <laughs> I also like the numbers, right? I'm a numbers guy. And it is really one important metric that we look at is the gross rent multiple, right? So like ultimately, so for folks that have done duplexes and single family, people talk about the 1% rule, right? And you want a, a property that is uh costs less than 1% of the of the monthly rent. 
So mm -hmm. on bigger stuff, we usually use the GRM, the gross rent multiple. We want that to be an 8.33 would be a 1% 1, 1 rule property. So like we want it to be around that eight mark or, you know, between eight mm -hmm. and nine. That's impossible. That's, I mean, almost literally impossible to find in Southern California. Yeah. And, uh, but those deals are still around in, in the Midwest and the Southeast. So we, we, we like it for that reason. My partner had uh, his portfolio in St. Louis. Mine was in Wisconsin. And we just kind of talked and said, hey, first one to find a big property that underwrites well, like that's going to be our market. And yeah. uh, first one we found that I'm actually going to talk about today was in yeah. St. Louis. And we've been in St. Louis ever since. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I did something similar. I, I had two cities that I was looking at, you know, one was Salt Lake City. The other was Columbia, South Carolina. One is where I'm from. The other one's from is where my wife's from, you know, so mm. just like places that we travel to frequently, places that we know. And uh, the first one we got under contract was South Carolina. So that, that ended up being my focus. Part of me wishes that we would have got one in Utah first because, you know, that's that's the market that I, I want to be into now. But uh, going back, you know, I, I don't I don't hear a lot of people talk about gross rent multiples. You know, I hear hear a lot more on cap rates. Why do you like the gross rent multiple instead of any other indicator? You know, I almost ignore cap rates because cap rate, of course, depends on the seller's reported NOI. And NOI is one of the easiest numbers to kind of fudge. And when mm -hmm. we dig in, almost always we land at a different, you know, not only is our NOI going to be different from what the seller reported, but like you dig into the seller stuff and we're really, we've learned a ton about due diligence over the, over the past few years. Yeah. When you really dig in like, oh yeah, well, we didn't report our accounting costs because that's more about this. And oh, we, we didn't even put management on there because like yeah. you guys can use your own manager or whatever. And it's like yeah. one of the properties we purchased recently, they said it was an eight cap or something. I can't even remember. And, and when we dug in, it, we saw that they had a 35% expense ratio. And we're like, that's ridiculous. Like that is almost unheard of. And when we dig, when we dug in, we realized, you know, there's, there were a lot of expenses that weren't getting reported. On the other hand, the rent and the revenue is, is harder to fudge, right? You know, and it's more of a top line yep. metric, right? So that's important to us. Whereas like their bottom line, like we're going to have our own bottom line compared to theirs, right? We do care about the top line, right? And we'll use our own expenses. It's an easy rule of thumb, mm -hmm. you know, um, because it's kind of like, here's the revenue. You're going to do what you, you can yeah. with it, right? We care way more about whether the property works for us than whether it worked for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that cap rate number is sort of, is more about how they did it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I agree with, with a lot of things. I mean, sometimes a seller, they're, they're just, people are inherently lazy, you know? And it's one of those things where, when you get a T12, it comes from the property management company a lot of times, and the property management company may not pay all the expenses. I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of things that are you know above the line, below the line expenses, and you know different people handle them different ways. You know, so yeah. so when I get a T12 and I know it's from the property management company, you know most likely there's a lot of little expenses, tax preparation. Okay, property management company almost never pays for tax prep expenses. That's never going to be on there. You know, bookkeeping expenses aren't going to be on there. Anyway, there's a lot of things that go into that that uh, just don't funnel down to the bottom line. So sure. Now we care about our calculated cap rate. You know, so like when we figure out what it's going to be with our expenses, we we do pay a lot of attention to that cap rate number. But that's the number that we calculate. Yep. All right. Cool. Cool. Love it. Love it. So let, let's talk about uh, one of these properties. You mentioned uh, a St. Louis one. So tell us about this St. Louis property, how you guys got it and uh, give us a, a review of the entire process. Well, we're actually going full cycle on this property. It's our, our first to go full cycle. I think I mentioned it at least last time I was on. I don't recall which deal we were talking about at the time, but yeah, we had a 24 unit. So this was the one I mentioned. I said to my partner, whoever, you know, we're going to mm -hmm. underwrite tons of properties and you need to underwrite everything, right? We're spending half of our time doing underwriting. And we found a 24 unit where the numbers worked. We did all of our underwriting and we determined, I mean, our, our main metric is for the investors, right? Like what can we get our investors? As long as you're treating your investors well, like you will be rewarded, right? We actually forecast something like a 19% IRR, which is really solid. And we were really nervous to basically... We never guarantee, you know, returns, obviously, but even project that, right? So we sandbagged everything and we got it down to about 15%. And we said, this is our first one. We're going to make mistakes. 
Mm-hmm. And we don't want to overpromise and, and under deliver, right? It was our first raise. It was a small one. We raised 680K, but we did it within just hours of doing our webinar. There was a lot of, especially at the time and you know, 2019, yeah. everybody was like big dollar signs in the in the eyeballs, right? A lot of money circulating around too. So oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, you know, millionaires who are happy to dump it into real estate. It's crazy that that was so recently, but and um <laughs> this is why I love real estate because a lot of that that Bitcoin money is uh I hope they reinvested in real estate. Yeah, did a quick raise knock on wood or luckily, you know, we did not make any big mistakes. You know, there all there was a trash company that didn't work out and we needed a new trash company. And we, you know, we went through several vendors and all credit to my partner for that. He's he's an amazing asset manager and negotiator and 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 everything. I would say we track very, very closely to our operational plan in terms of managing expenses and getting the revenue we expected even above a little bit. Mm-hmm. Our CapEx rehab plan went way faster than we thought it would. We had forecast that that would take three to four years Mm -hmm. and we completed rehabbing the entire property without kicking folks out, without... Mm -hmm you know, anything drastic in about 16 months. That brings us to literally just a couple months ago, right? So that was, Mm -hmm. that was, you know, almost, almost two years ago, we were doing the raise and everything. We saw interest rates coming up really fast, right? I mean, historical, I think there were 370, 75 basis points increases in a row at three separate meetings, yep. but cap rates had not come up uh, a lot yet. And and I know some folks are probably going to be more familiar with these terms than, than others, but there's, there's a gap between, you know, interest rates coming up and the cap rates rising. And we were done with our value add. And another thing about value add investing is your returns tend to sort of you get diminishing returns after the value add is done, right? Now mm-hmm. it's only going to grow at at, an, at uh, you know inflation rate. So we realized like, hey, it, now's the time to sell. I know our business plan was five years. We talked to our investors and we said we can beat handily the, our fifteen percent forecast, but it's only going to be for you know mm-hmm. two years or a year and a half essentially. Yeah. If we can get you guys into another one of these, <laughs> you know who's in? And and everybody said like, yeah, I'm in. Yeah. You know. We're going full cycle on that one. It closes at the end of the uh, end of the month. And most of our investors are going to get a great check. A lot of them are like, just send me a check for the profits. Keep my keep my principal and just roll it into the next one. Or nice. we've had folks uh, round up, you know, like keep the profits, keep the principal and round me up to, you know, 100K yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And we've we've met a lot of investors since then too who are, who are in this. So it's been great. It's kind of like, you know, the the aspiration should be the aspiration of syndicators. You know, once once you've done one deal, you know, when it comes full cycle, if you've done a good job and you have a good relationship with your investors, that money should be recycled into, I mean, everybody's situations are different, but the hope is, you know, you raise 600,000, you return a million dollars, you know, you get most of that back in, you know, and and you know, what, what I've seen and what a lot of syndicators see is just that snowball effect of it was really, really hard for me to get this investor in the first time. But now when the second, third and subsequent deals come out, it's just like, yep, let's keep going. Yep, let's keep going. So I, I think uh, just the fact that you're getting most of that money back and most of that money reinvested tells tells you you've done a good job with, uh, with investor relations and everything you've done. So the, the first one. Uh, we had 107 investors in our database before we did our first deal. So okay. we met and we met hundreds, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so don't, uh, yeah, I don't want to minimize the early hard part of, of, <laughs> yeah. of, of getting those guys onboarded, but yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. It's, it should be easier from here on out. Yeah. You, you put a lot of work into the first couple. You really, really do. And, uh, like I said, it, it does start snowballing, you know? And so that's the idea. Now the hard part is lining up another purchase price, you know, right when you or another purchase right when you sell or another investment opportunity right when you sell. That's that's yeah. proved uh, to be a little more difficult um for me anyway. For so, sure, yeah. But cool, cool. Well, awesome, glad it's done well for you. I think that's the one we talked about on our earlier podcast episode, but uh you know, if not, you know, we we talked about the other one as well. Cause you did a, a like a 60 unit, if I'm remembering right, in yeah. So that, that first one was 24 units. The next one we did was 61 units in Northbrook. That's been going really well as well. We're we're ahead of our projections there. A lot of those investors are are jumping on this on this latest one. And then yeah, to bring you totally up to speed, 
I was approached by a group of physicians um, somewhere in between those two properties. And we talked for like a year and they kept checking in. Hey, you know, we, we want to invest. We, I, you know, I think they found me on Facebook or, or something. Yeah. And, you know, we want you to place some money. We have a little group here. We said we weren't going to do any more big, uh, any more small deals, like 24 mm -hmm. units. It was a small deal at this point. They're like just the four of us, you know, like we'll, we'll just do a joint venture or something. We found, we found one that just perfectly fit their criteria and the numbers nice. were and uh, so we did a joint venture with with a small group of doctors. Okay. And that one's been great too, different terms. The aspect of that one I find really awesome is I enjoy teaching. I know you enjoy teaching too. And every Wednesday I meet with them and we just do like a lesson based, like a real estate investing lesson yeah. All case studies from real stuff that, that, you know, my partner and I are working on. So mm -hmm. yeah, they're on the East coast. So it's really late for them. We all just pour a little glass of bourbon or something and like yep. discuss, you know, underwriting and stuff. Yeah. So those, have, those have been a lot of fun. Sounds like a lot of fun. Sounds like it right up my alley. So, uh, <laughs> well, cool, man. Glad, glad that's going well for you. I did my first JV last October, you know, one investor put up 60% of everything Two other people, you know, I, I threw in smaller amounts, but, uh, yeah. First, first JV ever. And I kind of like them. Yeah. Kind of nice not having to get that investor report out, you know, every month, you know? Yeah. So, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, they're, they're way more intimate. It's still like a, feels like a team sport, you know, we always talk yeah. about in syndications, but it's a very small group of, you know, I love our bigger deals too. This, this last mm -hmm. one, we have 30 investors on, but you know, yeah. you're mostly communicating by just big emails, not, you know, little zoom calls with. Yeah. People. I mean, the person who's in charge of managing it, I mean, she lives really close to the property. And so she sends us emails. We hop on a phone call once a month and, you know, everything's fine on, on the bigger deals, you know, after that, that once, you know, the report comes out and that once a month phone call or however frequently you're doing it with your group, you know, then it comes down to, okay, now I've got to type this up, send it out to my investors. And anyway, that's uh, the one part I very much enjoy about the JV is not having to do that part. But yeah. Yeah. Just me, just me. Well, cool. So question that I love to ask everybody where we are switching gears a little bit here. And, and that's about your why, your motivation. So what is your big burning why? Yeah, you know, I, I remember you asking this last time and it's, you know, it's changed a, a little bit. You know, last time I think I talked about how my father had recently passed away and he was young and, you know, I, I didn't want to do the, the grind for the rest of my life. And that's all very true. You know, I definitely wouldn't call real estate passive on the, on the managing side, of course. But financial rewards have, have been there and I, I definitely am on a path to retire early and, and et cetera. So that's great. In any job I've had, I have three sort of criteria. Am I, uh, am I influencing the bottom line, mm -hmm. right? Am I learning something every day? And am I having fun? Okay. Yeah. And going all the way back to, I don't know, when I was working in restaurants, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think... Those three shift, all three, I, I think of them as like air, water, and food, right? Like you can go without any one of those for a little while, but not indefinitely, right? I think when I when I started in real estate, it was more of like a math problem in a way to, you know, increase my net worth and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But like the fun aspect has just increased and increased mm -hmm. since then, you know? And I'm just, I'm having lots of fun now. And like, now I'm thinking about, you know, what does retirement really mean? You know, like I, I could see myself doing this for the rest of my days, you know, whether I'm calling it retired or not, you know? <laughs> so I, I can too. I mean, I, I envision kind of a semi-retirement where, you know, I, I just, I just play kind of a behind the scenes role and pull strings, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, that, that's how I see it. I, th I think 10 years from now, you know, I'm just going to be looking at deals and yep, I'm in that one. Nope. I'm not. Yeah, That's my idea of retirement, you know, but uh, sure, sure. And if I, I want, I would love to be a full time, you know, <laughs> I would love to be an LP like like my yeah. own LPs and and just be able to point and 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 shift some money around. But but I also just I just I, I like the management and operating mm -hmm. aspect of it as well. So yeah. and I'm and I'm learning a ton too. You know, that's that's just increased. So. I tell you what, uh, what I enjoy, and everybody has like something different. I enjoy the hunt. You know, I enjoy the the sprint. You know, trying to get your offer accepted, and then you know the sprint to getting it closed. You know, and then you know you hand it off to the person on your team that loves the management part of it. But anyway, that's that's my favorite part of it is just just that, just that hunt right there. But sure. uh, anyway, last Happy. question for you, and then we'll bring Dane on. What's next? We're selling one property and we're literally buying another and we're rolling clause uh, to push the closing date out two weeks because we're, we actually right now are closing on both of them on exactly the same day, which can't really happen. So uh, we're pushing one out 
but just the amount of work that's involved in buying one property and selling another at the exact same time is so much going to take not a not a break from you know operations or anything like that um i'm sure my 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 partner who man does more on asset management that's when his job gets you know crazier i think we're going to take a little bit and focus on like operations building our investor network we've talked about starting things like you know contacting property property owners directly or setting up systems to do that rather than you know being beholden to to brokers for everything like really operationalize and learn. Like I'm considering there's a extension class at Harvard in, in real estate finance, um, considering doing, you know, just getting better at, at what we do. Give me the details to that class. That sounds fun, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a full on course, you know, it's, mm-hmm. I, I think it's 15 grand or something, you know, it's not just like a quick yeah, onesie doozy or whatever, but I'm talking to some other of the of the big names. Yeah, a lot of times we're, and I don't think we want to scale up in the sense that like, we do want to keep it boutique. We brought on a third partner this year for the first yeah. time, and I don't think we'll be taking on new partners for a long time. We don't want to grow too fast, but we want to, we want to operationalize the way that the big guys do. Yeah. So we're talking to family offices now, we're learning about preferred equity. We're, you know, learning how, you know, more about agency loans and how those work. So uh, pausing a little bit, I think we'll probably do another acquisition still this year, Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, take a couple months off, I think. Awesome. Awesome. Well, best of luck to you. And I I look forward to, uh, you know, seeing the next text saying, hey, we just closed on this next property. So pretty cool. All right. Well, shifting gears again, Dane, how you doing, bud? Doing great, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, good having you on. Uh, It's been great seeing you. And for for the listeners, I think... uh, you know, Dane and I met on a Facebook group and we've seen each other in person at a couple of conferences in the last two months. So Dane, appreciate uh, appreciate you coming on again and tell us about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Brian. It's uh, awesome to see you at a conference. It's nice to put a face to uh, somebody that you meet on social media. Yeah. Real um, people, yeah. The R- IRL friends now, yep. Yeah, so I'm so excited to be here. You know, with another mentorship in Raise Masters, Hunter teaches you to get on some podcasts and start with the worst first. Well, so I'm starting here with the opposite. I'm here on Brian Briscoe, the world famous guys podcast yep. right here. So I was wondering where you're going to go with that. I'm like, hold on a second. We might have to edit this out. You know. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting at the top, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is It's, it's a great podcast. And it's I, I think it's a perfect first time podcast for anybody, to, to be honest with you. So. Well, cool. Um, yeah. So yeah, Raise Masters was, I think, where we met. And you put a lot of energy and a lot of money into education. Talk, uh, please tell us what your mindset is around that and uh, you know why you're, why you're willing to do that. Sure. Yeah. So I'm just a concrete guy and mm-hmm. I really wanted to self-educate myself through reading books. And mm-hmm. I knew that the fastest way to do this was to get into mentorships and mm-hmm. spend some money. So yeah. at this point, I've probably spent 60K on my education and then read some of the best books out there, but learned about multifamily apartments, just syndications, economics, you know, all these things come into play. I love listening and learning podcasts. I'm listening to a steady stream of podcasts, reading great books. Uh, I just think that's essential to accelerating your learning curve. Yep. And I mean, you talk about podcasts and books. You know, if you look at podcasts and books versus coaching programs, you know, what's what, what do you think the biggest difference is in, in what you learn and how fast you learn? I think books are great because they fit, you know, somebody's 20 year experience into 300 pages, yep. which is amazing. But then with the mentorship, you get you you're involved in a network mm-hmm. of successful individuals and you can ask questions and just get instant feedback. So they both have their pros. I wouldn't say there's too many cons to either one of them. Mm -hmm. might take some time to read a book, but both are great tools to get into. Yeah. Appreciate you sharing that. I mean, uh, it's something I I did. I did mentorship when I started out. I've been in several different groups and it's one thing, one thing to read it. And and personally, I think I do better when I'm talking with people, you know, which is why I've actually learned so much from this podcast itself, but uh, anyway, appreciate you sharing that. And, uh, you know, I, I think you're going to be taken off like a rocket ship here, you know, so let's talk a little bit you, about your background. You mentioned you're a concrete guy, you know, tell us about your background. Tell us a little bit about what you meant about being a concrete guy too. So I have a little bit of entrepreneurial experience. About five years ago, I started my own concrete company. Uh, mm-hmm. We specialize in flat work and stamped concrete. Mm-hmm. We could do curb and gutter floors, a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. 
I had a few successful years and made some money, but it's uh, it's just so hard on your body and you can only do it for six months out of the year before it's cold, mm -hmm. you know? So I've bled, sweat, I've cried, I've put it through the ringer. It's not an easy profession. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so why multifamily then? Well, I was about to buy a Hellcat, a nice car. My uncle said, dude, yeah, you need to understand what a liability is and what an asset is. Mm -hmm. So my uncle Jed, he invests in multifamily apartments and he offered me the opportunity to throw some money in on an apartment complex. Mm -hmm. So I did a little bit of research, did my due diligence, kind of just trusted him because he's family mm -hmm. and you know, I see that he travels the world, does what he wants on his own time. So I was like, you know what, I, I, that's what I'm interested in. I don't want to be on my hands and knees doing concrete for the rest of my life. So I put some money to work for me and it's been doing great. I get great returns and I just love the idea of letting your money work hard for you. And now you're moving to the driver's seat. So got into multifamily because of an uncle. You've seen his lifestyle and, you know, now you're, you're knocking on the door, trying to, trying to get in and do exactly what he does. Yep. Yes, sir. Good. Love it. Love it. Nice to have that, uh, that positive role model and it's nice that it's family too. I mean, that's huge. So mm -hmm. back to going to a mentor and, uh, so my uncle won't spoon feed me anything, you know, so I, he'll offer me books to read yep. and then, uh, I read some books and then I ask him some questions if he has time and just, mm -hmm. that's why I like diving into these mentorships. Mm -hmm. You have a whole nother network of people to talk to. Yeah. A lot of times, you know, when you, when you look at mentorship relationships, there's got to be value add both ways. And uh, the pay to play mentorship, I mean, the, the value proposition is super simple. It's it's money for time, but it's probably better if, if you could figure out, you know, a different relationship, but it's faster. The money for time thing just fast, but uh, absolutely agree. Well, cool. Let's let's talk about your why. And then uh, we'll get on to some questions here. So what's what's your big burning why? So my why, it's kind of, I have about three parts to it. One is my legacy. I'd love to leave a legacy behind. Man, that's a tough question because I know it's just, it's more about money. I, I love teaching people. I love just being able to share and spread the word. Yeah. Let's see. Another part of mine is I, I really, I want to make my family proud. You know, I've always been smart and successful in what I do. You know, I branched off into my own direction with my concrete business. So I just, I want to make everyone around me proud. So mm -hmm. that the time freedom and traveling is huge to me. Of course, being financially free, who doesn't want to be financially yeah. free? But um, well, then my third one is not wanting to work intensively <laughs> for the rest of my life. You know, I don't want to work in the freezing cold with yeah. cold toes and fingers, man. It's, that's miserable. <laughs> yeah, absolutely is. Well, cool. Uh, well, yeah, appreciate you for sharing that. You know, I, I could tell, you know, there's probably some more personal stuff just, just below there that uh, I, I could tell was, was ready. To, we'll save that conversation for a later time then. But now, hey, we got Michael on the line. What do you want to ask him? Well, it's great to meet you, Michael. I'm yeah, glad I got to listen to your, your biography and uh, you sound like an, an, you know, an experienced investor. So I got some questions for you. Yeah. So this one's kind of a loaded question. Um, it's how are you knocking down people's limiting beliefs? You know, how do you identify somebody's limiting belief and what are some of those that you're encountering? You have to start with yourself, right? So I had plenty of limiting beliefs, right? And there's a balance too, right? Like I have been in tech from the start, as we saw with SVD and, and so much in tech. One of the biggest ways that people fail is they go too big, too fast, right? You know, there's both sides you need to sort of balance, right? But I do think generally people do think too small. I did start with multifamily. And I did have the limiting belief that that was, you know, the biggest deal I could do was, you know, 150 K for a, for a, a duplex or something like that. And it did take, as I mentioned before, several rounds to get rid of that limiting belief in my own head. Right. And start yeah. and start going bigger. I mean, what helped me was uh, surrounding myself with people that do big deals. Right. So you talked about mentorships and, and I haven't done a formal mentorship, but I mean, Brian, frankly, if, if I have a mentor, it's, it's him. And I, <laughs> I was feeling guilty because I was like, yeah, that value prop is supposed to go both ways. And I feel like I have not <laughs> added a whole lot of value to our relationship, but he's, he's been tremendous. I will give you a, if you do ever do paid mentorship, like that's going to be a fantastic value for whoever signs up. Cause Brian's amazing. Surrounding myself with people who do big deals, like for whom, you know, doing a, a $3 million deal, a $30 million deal is, is not a big deal, right? And like getting themselves to calm down about that. In my sort of W-2 world, it, things got easier because I started out, I grew up in Wisconsin. I was I was a restaurant guy, but 
I don't know how many times I was dumping grease from a fry, whatever, into a container or behind a restaurant in 20 below zero, you know, whatever. And I said like, yeah, trading your time for money and trading your body for money is just like, that's not, that's not a winning proposition for anybody, you know? And uh, it took me a while to realize like the people who are the, the most well compensated, it seems to be for their brains and their experience. And maybe I should get on this tip of <laughs> yeah. educating myself and being, being paid for my expertise and not my, you know, freezing cold hands, dumping grease and doing stuff that other people don't want to do. Right. That was a limiting belief I had to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And then with others, you know, it's, I wish there was a simple answer to that, but I think reminding people, you know, staying calm and cool when things come up, talking about big deals and small deals in the same ways, in the sense that like a 1% rule, you know, you're familiar with that. There's something very similar in, in large multifamily, you know, the, the gross rent multiple, like making those connections. So people are like, oh, this is just like a duplex, except we're buying 28 instead of two, you know, getting people to think along the kind of the same lines, you know, is helpful. I don't know if I'm quite in the whole kind of like Grant Cardone, like 10x, you know, every thought you have 10 exit or whatever, I'm not like quite there, but probably 2x, you know, I mean, whatever, you're, whatever your deal you're doing, like probably 2x on the next one, you know, so and learn and be very thoughtful about it. But, you know, maybe go a little bigger stretch. Yeah. I love that, man. Another thing I can tie in with you is my first LP investment was in St. Louis. Oh, right on. And, and worst case scenario is my money gets doubled. So oh, wow. that's another confidence booster that I give, you know, uh, to other people as I'm trying to attract LP investors. So yeah. fantastic. It's been a phenomenal stretch for real estate for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely. All right. Next question, Michael, is uh, who's your avatar? Who's your ideal dream investor? Like, who are you trying to help? So dream investor that I'm trying to emulate or who's the ideal investor I would love to have? <laughs> To have. Oh, to have. So like, for example, mine is construction professionals like myself or athletes. You know, I'm a football player. I want to reach out to football players, basketball players. Yeah. You know, I love, this is probably not the norm for, for most sponsors, but I love the people that are actually really interested in real estate and are hungry to learn. Yeah. So a lot of our investors are a mix, right? I mean, we'll take you know, anybody who's making an educated decision about it. We have lawyers, we have doctors, we have lots of high net, lots of tech. You know, for some people, it's just like, I need to diversify and I've heard real estate is good and I trust you and, you know, et cetera. That's fine. Our last JV was a group of physicians who are actually very interested in semi-retired. So they're in a group that I, I'll probably give a free shout out to. I think, it's, I believe it's called the semi-retired MD. And that that term it immediately resonated with me, semi-retirement. We've set up a, a, a Wednesday sort of education meeting. So every Wednesday night we get together and, and chat and that's been great. My ideal investor is somebody who's engaged, wants mm -hmm. to learn, could potentially be a future, you know, general partner and just likes talking real estate because I really like talking real estate. So <laughs> I'll, I'll mention, mention something about that. You know, if, if your ideal investor is already interested in real estate, you're going to be one step ahead. Okay. Cause you don't have to convince them that real estate is a good investment. You know, yeah. if, if your ideal investor is a doctor, you know, using that example, cause we're, we're talking about physicians, you know, you, you may, you may be able to, you know, get time with doctors, but the first thing you have to do is start convincing them that real estate is a good investment, you know, now yeah. we, with a doctor, you know, the juice might be worth a squeeze because they typically are accredited investors, you know, by income and net worth, you know, so, um, but yeah, one, one of the things that makes things a little easier is, you know, trying to appeal to the people who are already interested in real estate. It's, it's one less, you know, a couple less, fewer conversations you have to have before you get to the investment. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm trying to change my identity from a concrete guy to a real estate guy, how else can I uh, let people know, you know, I, I'm trying to speak with passion. Like when I talk about real estate, when I talk about geology, when I talk about concrete, my interests, I'm, I'm really uh, excited. I have a lot of energy. So how do I let people know that I'm a real estate guy now and not just a concrete guy? <laughs> I mean, that's hard to fake, uh, but I'm getting the sense of excitement from you. So, you know, that's, that's the first step, right? Yeah. I think that excitement is palpable. I think educating yourself is important because people that are excited about something go out of their way to learn about it. And when you show people that you know about it as well, you don't come across as just like somebody who's just excited, but not directed, you know? So, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're doing all the right things and, and some of it comes with, just comes with experience, right? You know, like you get into those enthusiastic conversations with, with people who know real estate and they're like, yep, this is one of the good guys. And I, I meet those, I love meeting those folks too, you know?
that, that makes sense. I've met some people like that at the gym, like you were just talking about that are, are already interested in real estate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'd almost come up, try to come up with a tagline, you know, from, from concrete to real estate or, you know, from foundation to, you know, whatever multi yeah. family and, and use that. I think, I think you got a really good background. You know, it, it's something that, I mean, I don't understand the chemistry behind concrete. You know, I know that you pour it and it, you know, hardens, but people <laughs> don't have to understand that. They understand that, you know, they understand concrete, they understand the foundations, you know, so I, I think you could probably take a tagline like that and, and, and run great idea. It, but. The guy, I'll give a very short uh, anecdote. The guy who does our uh, inspections in St. Louis mm-hmm. is very well known. Everybody knows him, hires him. He's, he's fantastic. And like, we had a, we had a property that, you know, of all the units, I think two of them had aluminum wiring, you know, done at some point in the seventies. And we were nervous about that. And man, when he explained aluminum wiring, he was just, he lit up. He talked for about half an hour. He was drawing the periodic table in the air and the isotopes <laughs> of aluminum and high tech aluminum wiring versus low tech. And like, you could tell that he just loved his job. And I just love that. That's just infectious, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like that's not, not building up your energy a, a ton right now, you know, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, well, we're, we're out of time. So one last question for each of you, how can listeners learn more about you? Mike, go first. Yeah, I mean, we're, I, you know, I don't have much to promote right now. We've been fortunate enough to have some really easy, you know, capital raises and things have been going really well. We are going to be working on relationships with lots of new investors over the next several months. I'd say probably the best is just hit up my website. It's Matanza Capital, which is hard to spell, but I think Brian's probably going to put a link. We'll put it in the, yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. So yeah. <laughs> and yeah, check out the website and and click the schedule a meeting uh, button, please. Don't just read, you know, like I love, I love talking with people and it's so much easier to have a conversation. Yep. Awesome. And Dane, same question for you. How can listeners learn more about you? So I'm at loboscapitalfunds.com. Um, I write lots of blogs and article content. You can schedule on my Calendly link from there. I'm also on my Facebook is Dane Marcus Johnson and on my LinkedIn is Dane Johnson. So you can find me on about any social all right. Sounds good. And we'll put links to, to all of that stuff in the show notes. So if you want to find either of these two guys, it should be super easy for you. You're doing it right. I got to get on the socials, man, and writing and, and yeah. uh, <laughs> you're off to a better start about that than I am for sure. It, it helps. We might have to get him in Raise Masters. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to eventually get off of social media, you know, so that I, I never have to. <laughs> You know, I, I'd love to get to the point to where I don't have to, you know, put anything on social media to get more investors. But uh, I yeah. mean, if you if you can if you can raise funds and you can do what you're doing without social media, you're a step ahead of me. Is all I got to say. <laughs> so time's up. So going to have to bid you guys adieu. I don't even know if I said that right, but it just sounded cool. <laughs> but uh, thanks for coming on the show today. All right. Thanks, gents. Thanks for your time. Nice to meet you guys. Hey, if you like that episode. Make sure to subscribe, but more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community yet, which we call a tribe of titans, you are missing out. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description to this episode or go to thetribeoftitans.info and we'll see you there. 